Hey guys, so welcome to our End of Colonialism in Africa Day. Um, make sure you are taking your notes as you watch the video. Also, please make sure you remember to write your summaries. I will be grading these at the end of the unit after you've watched all of the videos. So make sure you're getting those taken care of as well. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So throughout the first half of the 20th century, Africa looked more like a European outpost than a continent of independent nations. European nations had colonized so much of the continent in the late 1800s. Um, after World War II, there were so many different groups of Africans who no longer wanted to be under European colonial rule that they really had no choice but to work for their independence and then build new nations after they had won that independence. So if you look on the last page of your notes, there is a map of Africa. Please color and label these three different kingdoms. So if you look, number one is Ghana. It's the one that has kind of like these round dots drawn as the outline of Ghana. Number two is Mali, which is this dashed line here. Okay. Number three is going to be your Songhai, which will follow this dark black line all the way around here. Okay. So as you can see by this map, Africa had been settled by many different European nations, but France and Great Britain had the most colonial possessions. During World War II, um, African soldiers fought with European soldiers to defend freedom. As a result, Africans no longer wanted to be dominated by colonial European powers. So the United Nations signed the Atlantic Charter in 1945, and what this does is give colonial nations the right of self-determination. So in other words, the freedom to choose their government. This charter ends up being the inspiration for many of the revolutions that occurred in Africa. The African push for independence started before World War II, though. French-speaking Africans had begun to express their desire to be independent, these people began to take great pride in their African culture, in their heritage, and in their values. The Pan-Africanism movement began as a way for Africans to feel connected through cultural unity. The main goal of this movement was to gain independence and bring an end to colonialism in Africa. The biggest problem, though, was that the European countries were not so enthusiastic about giving up their colonies and the raw materials coming from those colonies. So they certainly weren't going to just give them up without putting up a fight. So let's take a look at some of the specific countries and what it took for them to gain independence. We're going to start in North Africa with Algeria. Um, North Africa had been colonized by France, and before World War II, France had thought of their African colonies as part of the country. They weren't viewed any differently, however, a new constitution put in place after World War II gave colonies more rights, such as self-determination. De Gaulle, could, um, who you should remember him from our World War II unit, he gave these French colonies a choice. They could either remain a colony of France and under French control, or they could become independent and lose all forms of French aid, such as financial support. But it wasn't just that a colony would lose money. There was a condition. If a colony wanted to leave France and become completely independent, they had to fight for it. And that's just what happened in Algeria. It was a very bloody conflict for independence. About one million French settlers lived in Algeria at this time. The French government was unwilling to give up control of Algeria. Violence broke out in 1945 and it continues until 1962 when the French finally granted Algeria its independence. From 1965 until 1988, Algerians attempted to modernize and industrialize their country, but it was unsuccessful. An Islamic party won both the local and parliamentary elections in 1990 and 1991, but the government did not accept the vote. And to this day, there is still a deadly civil war that's raging between Islamic militants and the government. Following World War II, the British in the Gold Coast area of Africa began making preparations for the colony to achieve independence. They allowed more Africans to be nominated to the Legislative Council, but Africans wanted full independence. Kwame Nkrumah led the independence movement and it was peaceful for the most part. He um, often used civil disobedience by organizing strikes and boycotts, and as a result, he often found himself in prison. 
In the long run, though, it was worth it. When the Gold Coast received independence in 1957, its name changes to Ghana, honoring the famous West African Kingdom of the past. Nkrumah was named the first prime minister and later the president for life. So during this revolution, there was very little violence, and this is an inspiration to other African nationalists across the continent. On to East Africa now. Kenya is the pink country that the arrow is indicating there. Kenya is not like Ghana in that the revolution was mostly peaceful. Um, Kenya had to fight for their independence. So Kenya was established as a British colony um, and therefore it was under British control. British settlers there uh, resisted Kenyan independence, specifically those who had farms in the very fertile highlands of Kenya. They certainly didn't want to give up their farmland. Um, it was prized farmland. Jomo Kenyatta was a Kenyan nationalist and he had very strong leadership abilities. He leads Kenya to self-government through the Mau Mau Group. This was a secret society of Kenyan farmers whose goal was to set the British farmers to get them off of the great farmland that was in the highlands there. They ended up using um, guerrilla war tactics and they terrorized the British farmers in the highlands in an effort to get them to leave the land. Kenyatta never admitted that he was associated with the Mau Mau, but he never condemned the group either. So because he wouldn't condemn the group, the British imprisoned him for almost a decade. Kenya was finally granted independence in 1963. Kenyatta became the prime minister and eventually he becomes the president of, Ken of Kenya. And Kenyatta died in 1978. In South Africa, a white minority had ruled a black majority. Um, this racial conflict was a result of colonial rule, and although South Africa had a constitutional government, the constitution gave power to the white people and denied the black majority any rights. In 1948, the white majority put in place a policy called apartheid. This was a very strict policy that separated blacks and whites. Uh, black South Africans were denied many basic rights. This, the African National Congress was established in 1912, um, and it starts to fight for the rights of black South Africans. Of course, the government does not approve of the ANC, um, and many of its leaders end up being put into prison as a result. Some of the methods that the ANC used were boycotts, strikes, um, those sorts of things to protest the racist policies that were going on. The government ends up banning the ANC, and many of its members were imprisoned. Nelson Mandela was one of those leaders. The police responded very brutally to these protests. For example, in 1977, they beat a very popular protest leader named Stephen Biko to death while he was in custody. These protests um, continued, and eventually the government had to declare a nationwide state of emergency in 1986. When Mandela was imprisoned, he had been sentenced to life in prison. So as a result of all of the unrest, the government put very repressive rules into place, such as only Africans could be spoken in school, as well as many hard consequences for breaking any apartheid rules. Despite this horrible time period in South Africa's history, the rules do start to change in the 1980s. In 1989, F.W. de Klerk was elected president, and his goal was to transform South Africa. In 1990, he legalized the African National Congress and released Nelson Mandela from prison, who had been imprisoned for 17 years. Over the next 18 months, the South African Parliament got rid of apartheid laws, and in 1994, Nelson Mandela was elected the president in a first-ever all-race election. Now, this wraps up what you need to know about the independence movements in Africa. Next video, we are going to be taking a look at the Middle East. So please don't forget to continue with your summaries. Also, you should be expecting a quiz covering India and Africa in the next few classes. I will see you guys soon.